Shall we jump in? Yeah. Yeah, so look at the camera, nice big smile, hold yourself up. Okay, not like that. <laughs> yeah. Scary. Howdy, glow and hi, and welcome to a Smith and Spoon Talks. This is very different to what we normally have when we're standing on a stage in front of loads of people in a boiling hot room. We are doing this on camera for the first time doing this, so this is new to us and it's interesting and we're bringing you guys along with us. I'm Josh Spooner. I'm Ethan Smith. This is a Smith and Spoon Talks. We're going to start this off with Ethan speaking first, then myself, and then we're going to go on to selected questions that has been given to us to answer for you guys. So the idea is basically we use our past and experiences to sort of give you guys a knowledge of what may go through people's heads. Could be your kids, could be a friend's kid, could be someone you're caring for or in the school system. It's basically just to show you sort of how we feel, what worked for us, what didn't work for us. We're in no means saying what we say is how to do it. We're just saying this is what worked well for us and we hope to inspire you to keep pushing and keep driving through those hard times. Right, so where I wanted to start with my story was back home when I was living with my parents. So I live with parents who suffer from quite significant mental health issues. My dad's got bipolar and my mum has uh, schizophrenia. I am currently diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. When I was younger, I went through a misdiagnosis, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But for the first 12 years of my life, I was living in a home environment which was quite difficult, partly because I didn't know I had Asperger's at the time. I used to get bullied and picked on at school and kind of social services and the system didn't pick up on all these things till quite later on in life for me. When I was diagnosed with ADHD, I was given this medication to try and calm my symptoms down. But I mean, this didn't work. All it did was hide symptoms and it also caused other problems. It would stop me from eating when, when I'm at school. So in the lunch hall, I would sit there and not eat my dinner and lunch staff would have to come over and try and get me to eat. I had quite a significant weight loss and was really, really skinny and that was a bit of a health issue at the time. I didn't really have any friends. Because I was different, other children used to take the mickey out of me. They might come over and take basketball away from me, run away with it, make fun of me because I was different. I think what was quite hard was I used to react very negatively to all of this. If someone upset me and made me angry, I would kick off and it would be a bit of a joke for other people, a bit of a laugh. In the classroom, I couldn't handle large class sizes. I can remember being in a class of about 30 children. If there was like loud noises, lots of people shouting and talking, I just couldn't cope basically. I can remember one time where a teacher asked me a question in front of everyone and I just felt so insecure, so embarrassed, so nervous. I think because of that sort of overwhelmingness and overstimulation, I just couldn't cope and I'm sitting there putting my hand, head in my hands. If anybody would make me angry, I'd flip tables, flip chairs, things like that and quite often just get kicked out of class. So because I did those sorts of things, the school thought I had ADHD. I ended up getting a diagnosis of ADHD from CAMS. Yeah, they put me on this medication which just didn't work. All it did was hide the symptoms and make me very, very dopey at school. You know, very, very sort of just not, not with it really. I'd get up in the morning, get ready for school. When my mum and dad used to give me this medication for the ADHD, quite often I'd try and refuse to take it. They used to have to hide it in jam and toast and things like that or, or put it in a a glass of milk and, and try and get me to take it in all those sorts of ways but quite often when the pill was given to me I would hide it under furniture try and put it in places where I, where I didn't have to take it and stuff like that I'd come home from school I'd jump on the xbox I'd sit there I'd play it and I'd play it till you know like gone midnight and then same routine again in the morning at 12 years old one of the biggest changes happened in my life my dad became ill and ended up going into hospital because of his mental health issues and he had a seizure my mum coped for a very short amount of time afterwards with me at home just me and her but then shortly after she couldn't cope and also had a relapse and ended up in hospital as well so then they both ended up in springfield hospital i was kind of left with nowhere else to go so i ended up going to live with my nan who was 90 years old at the time i don't know whose idea this was but for a 90 year old grandma to be looking after a child that has all of these issues with adhd and hyperactivity i think it would have been quite difficult for her she only had me there for a month and then i went into foster care in january to 2010. 
So when I went into foster care, it's because my nan couldn't cope, mum and dad were still in hospital, and I didn't see them until the following year. So I had the whole year without being with my parents, living in a world of uncertainty, not knowing where I was gonna go, where I was gonna be. But when I went to live with my foster carers, they are very experienced foster carers with caring for kids who have got autism or ADHD or other emotional behaviour disorders and it didn't take them long to work out that actually I didn't have ADHD at all because I wasn't hyper because I was ADHD, I was hyper because I couldn't cope because I was overwhelmed, overstimulated. I wasn't aware of how to communicate normally like neurotypical young people might. So I think all of these kinds of things made teachers, professionals around me kind of think, oh, you know, he can't cope, he must be ADHD. You know, he's hyper, he's got anger management issues, things like that. But it wasn't the case. It was just being overwhelmed with the number of children in a classroom, things that were going on at home that weren't quite right, you know, just the sensory needs. So I might be walking to school with mum in the morning and a siren goes past and I'm starting doing that because I can't deal with the noise or the flashing lights of police sirens or ambulance sirens and things like that and I'd, it would just set me off and I'd go into some kind of autistic meltdown and you know I'd wave my hands and start flapping and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure some some of the families that are going to be watching this video might be able to relate to that they might be seeing it in their in their young people in their families. So when I lived with my foster carers they recognized I was ASD and not ADHD so they took me to camps to get an assessment for ADHD. This took quite some time because every time I'd go to camps and have visits it would be a different professional every time. I think CAMS is just one of those services that's really, really under-resourced, underfunded, and I think, yeah, it needs more resources, but what was really tricky for me was the inconsistency in the staff that I was seeing. Quite often I would go to CAMS for appointments. I, would, I did this when I had ADHD and also when I was going through the process of getting diagnosed with Asperger's. Getting that diagnosis took almost a year my foster carers would constantly campaign and advocate for my needs and what support I needed. And quite often professionals would say, this is why we can't do that, oh, that service doesn't exist anymore, this, that and the other. And there was just all these obstacles and barriers. It's, it's no one professional's fault, but it's, it's just the whole way the system works doesn't it doesn't work because the amount of time it takes for children to be able to get the right support, there's so much damage done in that time. They don't have the support. You need to get that support sooner rather than later. I'm sure most of the viewers will agree with that. So once I got the diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, the next part of the process for, for me was actually being able to get a statement or EHCP as they're now called. This took about a year. During that year I was in a secondary school which didn't suit my needs. It was an all boys school, it was quite rough. Wouldn't say it's a bad school but it was a bad school for me. It didn't suit my needs. I needed a school where I had some kind of mainstream school but with a unit or somewhere I could go for extra support when I needed it. I found class sizes very overwhelming. You know, some of the other children a bit rough and again, bullying was a massive issue for me because I wasn't like everybody else, I was different. Other children used to pick up on that and pick on me. The next step was to move schools. So I moved to a school called Stanley Park in Carshilton. Um, the reason why this school really, really suited my needs was because it was a brand new building, state of the art, massive open, they have this massive atrium in the school, which is nice open, there was lots of space, so it didn't feel so claustrophobic. Whereas my old school was quite an old designer building with very narrow corridors, so you'll be walking between classes and it just felt more busy, more people, and it, it again added to that sort of overwhelming feeling of, of, of too many people being around me and doing the hips in my hands. So when, when I was in the, in the new school, I had a learning support assistant. I had some one-to-one -one sessions and this worked for me because it helped me get, get into a stable, consistent environment. I knew I could go back to this autism base for support when I needed it, but I could also have the opportunity of getting into a mainstream classroom so that I can experience the same sort of teaching that a mainstream young person should be entitled to receive. Another thing that helped me when I was in school, in my in my second secondary school, and I had a mentor from Jigsaw, first Jigsaw for You, 
then uh, I've had two mentors from Maps, all of which have significantly changed my life. They've helped me by giving me opportunities for confidence building, boosting my self-esteem and improving social skills essentially. And I had one mentor who helped me with social skills and then another mentor later on in life who helped me with transition and moving into independence. So that was when I moved to university and that person helped me with transition to uni. When I was about 14, 15 years old, and I'd been with my foster carers long enough for me to trust them and for them to become familiar and consistent role models and figures in my life, I felt a bit more comfortable to sort of come out of my shell a bit. There was another foster child that used to live here with me who, he was from the traveling community. Uh, me and him used to go out and get up to all sorts of mischief. Despite some of the things that we were doing as teenagers, which were quite naughty and things like that, it was a great experience for me to see that because it improved my social skills. Some of the people we used to meet from, from uh, quite disadvantaged backgrounds kind of just helped me to socialise and engage with those kinds of people, become more understanding of, 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 of that. Later on, when I was even more confident, I started getting involved in all these activities like swimming, football, I even did ice hockey. I also did police cadets, children in care council where I was representing other looked after children. I also was a bit of an advocate for other autistic children at Jigsaw For You and, and other charities supporting children in need. I also got involved in something called the Youth Parliament. So that was a great experience. By getting involved in that, I was able to really 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 build my confidence and communication skills so I was able to go on these summer camps where I'd do team building activities with other young people I was able to go and sit in the House of Commons and participate in a debate about mental health and getting young people's voices heard and I absolutely loved it and it really helped build my confidence after I built up my confidence and self-esteem through doing these kinds of activities what I was doing next was going into thinking about university so I was doing my A levels and I was doing the youth parliament but the next step was thinking about uni and what I wanted to do. I decided I wanted to go into politics because I wanted to represent other looked after children and other children with disabilities that perhaps are quite vulnerable and unable to advocate for themselves. I want to make a difference and raise awareness about just how vulnerable these children are really and when support isn't there what damage it can do but also talk about the positive and how great it can be if you do get the right support at the right time in life. So I went into doing politics at university and yeah, that was great. But one of the things I really, really struggled with with the transition to uni was mixing with other uni students. There seems to be this culture at university of, of doing all of the kind of the freshers week, the clubbing, get involved in all these societies and things like that. And, and I think I found that quite overwhelming. I felt as though you almost have to act a certain way to fit in with other uni students. And I just found that very, very hard. But at the end of the day, I think that because of the confidence building I'd already done, I was able to overcome that. I commuted to university, I didn't live there. I'd recommend that for anyone on the spectrum who is a bit scared of the transition to university. The reason for that is because from what I could gather from other students that were living in halls, it's very, it can be very difficult in terms of that independence. If you struggle a bit with independence, you're not quite ready to live on your own. I think it's best to travel to uni if you can. For me, University of Surrey was the university that I went to. The University of Surrey was good for me because they had an additional learning support team. They didn't specialise in autistic young people, but they had quite a good awareness of that. But they also worked with dyslexic students and, and other things as well. But for me, it was really good because I always had that mentoring support. It was always ongoing for me. So as long as you've got that consistency, I think that really helps. But I would travel to uni. Um, another positive of that was obviously saving money. Your expenses aren't as high. And if I had a rough day at uni because I was struggling with all the social all the social expectations that, that you're kind of expected to be able to do at uni. I was able to come home in the evenings and be back with my foster carers who I see as family and be able to offload how my day's gone, what sort of things might be worrying me, what I'm sort of excited for. And again, it was just more sort of coaching and support that I've got.
just before finishing uni actually, I was also getting involved in being a mentor for young people that had gone through what I went through. I did mentoring for someone called Laura Kirby, who again is another really, really inspirational person that's been involved in my life. And she runs an organization called Kite and Positive Autism Support and Training. I recommend that to families. If you've got, uh, if you're a parent and you've got a child who's got quite challenging behaviors and they're also on the spectrum, basically mentoring and tutoring that sort of thing but it's, it's definitely something to signpost because it was for me to be able to do mentoring for her and support children that went through what i went through i found that really really rewarding but also i think it helps the children because they're again building their confidence and self-esteem through doing fun activities if it's mentoring it's what changed my life so hopefully by me being able to be a mentor as well i can help change other people's life as well I've also been doing fostering panels. What they'll do is they'll interview potential foster carers. That again was another great opportunity that I've, I've got involved with because as a care leaver, I have this lived experience that I can help bring to the table, kind of interviewing foster carers so that we get the right people caring for our children in the care system. And also being on the spectrum, I'm also bringing that viewpoint of someone with lived experience of autism and how that's kind of affected me and might affect other autistic children that are placed with foster carers. So again, that's another thing that I sort of really value to be a part of. So now I feel like I'm on a path to success. So I've had this experience of going through the care system, being a young person on the autistic spectrum. I feel like I've overcome some of life's challenges for uh, young people of that background. So what I'm hoping to do now is I am hoping to make a difference and raise awareness about how challenging it can be for young people from those backgrounds. And I'm actually now training to become a social worker. I'm hoping to work with children with disabilities or maybe children from looked after backgrounds. What I want to do is be an advocate for children with those experiences and, and in some way hopefully change the system, perhaps motivate other professionals who might be struggling working with these young people from these backgrounds. But my ultimate goal is to make a difference and I want to help people from backgrounds of Asperger's syndrome, autism, ADHD and looked after children. I think I'm going to end my talk here. I think I've said enough now. I'm going to hand over to Spooner who's going to share his story and hopefully that gives you some insight as well. Thank you for listening. So this is my story and it does differ a little bit from Ethan's. I'm not autistic. Well, I haven't been diagnosed of it, so we'll just put it there. But I was brought up rather rough, you know, I had problems at school. I was the problem child. I had an abusive household. I was going to school. I wasn't understanding work. And as you probably know, when most kids don't understand work, they don't want to appear dumb. So they react aggressively to act like, it's not that they don't understand, it's just that they can't be bothered or it's not cool enough to do, so I reacted angry. You could imagine me as a kid, I was obese, anger issues, you know, bigger than every kid there and some teachers, to be honest. People never asked why I was so angry. They just assumed I was a, a troubled child and that I enjoyed getting in fights and I enjoyed feeling angry and aggressive 24 seven. But little did they know I was going home to an abusive household where having a bunch of drugs on the table was the norm, where my mum would react that as off a child, kicking and screaming. We didn't have doors in our house. They were removed from either headbutting or punching or kicking or ripping off. It was just my household, you know, we had drug dealers in and out, loads of drugs, loads of fights. And all my friends and peers around me were, you know, a lot older adults who, what I would say failed at life mostly for most of them. I will bluntly say that, I'm very blunt, you know. They're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and they're hanging around doing drugs, looking out to do crime. And that was the influence I had around me. So it was no wonder why I went to school, I would react aggressively because when I go home, I was fighting my mum's boyfriend who was off his head on crack, who's putting a knife to my throat after breaking her jaw and trying to kill me. And that was me as a kid, I was like nine years old. That's what I was going home to. So when I was going to school, I found it really difficult to fit in with the other kids, you know, they're out there playing football, stuck in the mud, British Bulldog, all these fun games that kids normally enjoy. And I'm sitting there knowing, you know, damn well that I've got to go home to what I have to go home to. And I couldn't really tell anyone about it because it's not one of them scenarios where you really open up in, in that the way I was brought up, it's not something you talk about with other people to get people in trouble, you know, it's like a snitching, telling sort of thing. We just didn't do it. So that was my norm. 
So when I was going to school and they would tell me to act normal, to fit in, do you think I had time to want to fit in to be normal? It wasn't the case. Oh, you need to do your homework. How can I do homework, you know, when my mum's smashing her head off the wall, screaming constantly? How am I gonna sit there and concentrate at the work when all I could think about is going home and getting into a fight? And it was like that every single day and evening. Kicked out multiple times. So if we're getting on to around, between the whole primary school section, I had multiple social workers, key workers, psychiatrists, people trying to help me in the school. The school I went to actually said they don't know how to handle me. Okay, so I in South London and I don't know what they're like now, this is not me slating them, but at the time they had no idea how to deal with me. I'll be honest, most I don't blame them whatsoever for not knowing how to deal with me. I was a, a big issue. <laughs> But yeah, they, they basically said to me, if I wasn't in prison when I'm older, it's because I'm dead. And that is the belief and trust that I had around me. Everyone around me would not believe me. If I got a question right in, a, in an exam, they would question me for cheating, even though I actually got it right. I had multiple key workers and I didn't really get along with them because it was the case of, they were trying to get me out of the house. They were trying to get me to do things in social environments, which, I had anxiety. I honestly had like a mile's length worth of disorders that they would suggest I had, but I was too aggressive to the point where they couldn't diagnose me of anything, including going to multiple anger management classes and getting kicked out on the first day of all of them for being too angry. Obviously having all this around me eventually reached a point where you probably guessed it, I was suicidal, I was self-harming, and it was a normal thing. And it wasn't the point of cutting myself to show people to scream for attention. It was the case of, I lived in a jacket long sleeve so no one saw. Learning different ways to hurt myself, whether it wasn't just cutting, but doing things destructive, like a self-destructive trait of depression. And that's what I was doing. I was going out, getting into real crime. And this is where it, it takes a turn for me. At this point, I wasn't going to school as much. I was getting involved with the wrong crowd, basically. The heavy drugs, heavy violence, knife guns, county lines, all different mix of people in all different areas. It wasn't a case of wanting it. I know, by no means did I want it, but I was so young and I didn't know how to not get involved with them because that's all that was around me. I had my grandparents there who could have supported me, but I knew in a position I was in with the way I was, I didn't want to embarrass myself going around and knowing that I would be so angry, that I would go around their house smelling of drugs and weeds and not being clean because the household was filthy. So I was stuck around the abusive people, the drug users, the drug sellers, the gangbangers, all those types of people. And it's no wonder why I turned out sort of the way I did. I mean, there's a long list of things I could tell you about what I did, but I probably shouldn't. At a certain point, this is where it really switched. My mum got diagnosed with aggressive cancer for the first time. She's had it twice since. And that's where everything sort of changed for me. On the day she was meant to have a surgery where she had, I think it was maybe 70% chance of dying. You know, she was frail, weak. She told me five minutes before she left, we had the ambulance waiting outside. She comes in crying and tells me my dad's just died. So at that point in my mind, as a kid, I think I was around maybe 12 years old. I'm basically saying goodbye to my mum and my dad's dead as well. So now I'm just sitting there. I cried for five minutes and then I went outside and played football. And I think that was the point in my life where I really lost my emotions and just became emotionless. And obviously we knew I was misbehaving in school because of my environment, but now my environment changed. I still had the people around me. However, there was a big change, a big impact on my life. You know, my mother's ill. I actually became her carer. I was used to being her carer when she was drunk, when she was off her face on drugs, and those that came over that were like that. And it was normal. I'm not, I'm not by any means saying I wish that would change. That's the way it was. I would have to lift her up and carry her to the toilet. She must have weighed around 40 something kg. I could lift her up with one arm. She lost all of her weight. She looked like a skeleton, like Lord Voldemort at the end of Harry Potter when he's just scrumpled up on the floor. That, that is what she looked like. Um, but yeah, so I'd have to carry her to the toilet, you know, urine, poo, blood, everything would fall out of all different orifices and I'd have to clean it up. And that was my, my household. That's what I would go home to. So now when I'm going to school, they wondered why I struggled, but no one ever asked that question. Then I went to high school, I went to Wandle Valley and there was two little ladies, but one of the main ones that had the longest impact, her name was Mandy. 
and she was this little woman and she was the only one that managed to take me. You know, I had all these big guys, all different people trying to control me and make me do things their way. Honestly, if th this woman would beat me up. Like if I, if I tried to backtrack or say I don't want to do that, she would, I, I would be afraid to say that to this woman, yeah? She got me to do the work in ways that work. She didn't teach me, she mentored me and that was the big difference. Because when you tell me to do something, it didn't work. But if you mentored it out of me, it does. And you'll be surprised when I do these talks or I ask a teacher, most of the time, they don't actually know the difference between teaching and mentoring. And eventually, I was going to school for two and a half hours, three times a week for a few years. And that worked for me very well. And then eventually, when my anxiety was getting lower and lower, I was able to integrate into the school to do my GCSEs. And at this point, I'm no longer involved with the gangs or anything like that. I actually was, I was 22 stone obese and I decided to go to the gym and do better. And I remember the day because I was in what you'd call a crack den or a squat. A guy comes in, there's a big group of us and they're all talking about how they need money to get drugs. And they start talking about how they can go, there's an old lady that walks to the shop and back and he notices she takes out money. And I thought, you know what, this is not the life for me. I've never enjoyed doing stuff like that. It's never been for me. If I think about it, the people that I was aggressive to were the ones that you know took the mick out of my weight, took the mick out of my aggression and enjoyed seeing me angry. Those are the people I was angry towards. And I was like, you know what, this isn't for me. I remember I got up and left and that was the last time I stepped foot in there, saw them and everything. So I went to the gym and what I would do is, is I would go to school and then I would go to the gym until the gym would close. And then I would go home, go to sleep and then go to school because the less time I could spend at home, the better. And that's what worked well for me. So I left school, I got my GCSEs, and I went to Nescott College. I really enjoyed it there. They said I would get low grades, and then ended up leaving with the highest possible grades you could get. It shows that it wasn't, it wasn't my ability of knowing things, it was, it was my ability to focus and their ability of how they worked with me. Because in college, I was able to do my own thing. They knew how to speak to me. I sort of become, I was becoming a young adult then. I moved out of the house at 16, sort of when I went to college. So all of a sudden, all of my problems were finished. I was no longer in that environment. I was no longer going home to, f to feel like I had to fight for my life, which was every day. It made a massive difference. So when I was in college, I really reflected that. And all of a sudden, I was cleaner. I was, I was healthy. I was focusing on my work and I was really enjoying it. So in college, I then decided I wanted to be a personal trainer. So I became a personal trainer actually in the gym alongside with being a student alongside with being a governor for the college. Now, could you imagine if you knew me back when I was a kid, to see me grow up and be a governor for a college, to be a PT being so obese as a kid and actually getting good grades when at school I was getting none. It was a big change and I, I fell in love with weight training and weightlifting and became a bodybuilder and I love it to this day, I train every single day you know, it, it's my passion, it's what I love. But at, when I came out of college, I realized, you know, there's more I can do. I stumbled upon a job as a mentor and a support worker. And I thought, I'll give this a go. I'm a support worker slash manager for units for young people, kids, adults with complex needs. Normally things like uh, ADHD, autism, social anxiety, bipolar, suicide or depression, or a, a list of things where it could be anything a lot of behavioural problems and things like that. Those are the people I work with and I feel I work best with them because I've been through it and I understand them. It's not the case of, I went to university, these are my qualifications so I can help you, I know what I'm doing. That's not the case. The case is, I know what you've been through, I know how it is and I talk to them real. I talk to them bluntly and I, you know, I can sympathise with them and understand their needs and what they're going through. Yeah, so my role as a sport worker is most of the time to, to teach them to be independent so when they leave us they can survive on their own and be normal sort of and live and survive and enjoy life and that, that's basically my role and I will help them with goal setting. Now for anyone that doesn't know how to do goal setting, it's a thing called smart targets. So you have a goal, this is your goal here and your goal is to reach here. But this is a big goal. So you start from lower and you do smart targets, realistic ones at first to get the big one. So if my goal was to get down to 10 stone, I'm not gonna do that in two weeks from 22. So what I do is, is I go, right, I'm at 22, I'm gonna to get to 20. From 20, I'm gonna to get to 17. From 17, I'm gonna to get to 15, whatever it is, to eventually reach that. And it will keep me motivated 
and keep me pushing and, and dedicated to keep going. And that's what I do with these kids. I would suggest if, if you haven't tried Smart Targets, give them a go because they, they are really helpful in any circumstance of anybody. It doesn't have to be a child. It doesn't have to be someone in need. It could be yourself. You know, Smart Targets and goal setting can really motivate you and strive for you to do more. After doing this for around three years now, I realized helping people is what I want to do. I'm motivating people and make it helping them be a better version of themselves and achieve more than they believe that they actually could. So I've turned to social media where I'm doing Instagram, I'm doing YouTube. I basically want to live my life. I'm self-employed because I really struggle to be told what to do by someone. I basically do social media where I like to post things and it could be a dumb selfie or whatever it is. But basically I'm growing, I'm growing my business, growing it and growing it to the point where I have a big following and in that way I can influence and motivate loads of people. Whether it be with training tips, with how to feel better, motivation, anything like that. That's what I like to do on social media. But I also like to be myself. And I think this is the big thing because right, I'm told I'm quite funny because of how like blunt I am and I'm myself. I have no care for anyone's opinion on me. As losing my emotions as a kid, I, I grew up from that point of not caring about what anybody thinks about me. And it just happens what I like to do and want to do is legal and people tend to like it. So I'll do social media, being myself, enjoy myself, my life, and be in full control of it, where I creating content for me is like art. It's like someone drawing a nice picture. It's like a baker baking an amazing cake. Filming, getting those angles, editing, making the structure of the video, the dynamics, and bringing it together is like an art form to me, and I love it. So with my content being, it could be healthy tips, training, dieting, whatever it is. It could be helping with motivation, dedication, staying on track, uh, mental health or behavioral uh, situations. It could be, uh, the main thing as well is obviously doing it for myself, being myself, is I just have fun and enjoy it. And my enjoyment and my, my dumb things I tend to say on a regular basis tends to make people laugh. I'm not trying to, I just say dumb stuff fairly often and if I can make someone laugh if they're at home and they're sitting there and they, they feel down if they can watch my video and feel not just motivated or take something from it but just feel happy for a minute and smile and enjoy their time watching it that's what I want to do and that's what I'm working on right now thank you for listening to my long story hopefully you took something from it and you remember just stay motivated we're going to answer a list of questions that were given to us now and we're going to go over there how did you get in this? <laughs> my legs don't fit under the table. Do you want me to move the table? No, my legs don't fit under the table. <laughs> so this is the part where we answer the questions that were given to us. We are joined again by Sophie from Smith himself. And the first question we're gonna jump straight in. Can you tell us what it was like when you found out you were autistic? Now, obviously this isn't a question for me. This is a question for you, Mr. Smith. So what was it like? So for me to find out what it was like to be autistic, it was more of a relief than anything. When I was diagnosed with that ADHD, for me, it didn't quite add up to how life was for me. So a thing for me is I, I like to go away and research stuff if I'm interested and I want to know more about it. And I will research that stuff until I know everything about it. With ADHD, my behaviour wasn't really ticking the box for what someone with ADHD might normally behave like. When you get diagnosed, I wouldn't take it as a negative thing because it could be all those problems you were having before, you now know how to cope with it realistically as there's so much out there and knowledge and experience people can, can help you with to deal with it. So if you don't know what's wrong and why you're acting different, how are you gonna fix it? Obviously, I was relieved to get the diagnosis of autism. And I think for me, what was brilliant about it is because I knew why I would act in certain ways. I knew why it was overwhelming to hear a police siren. I knew why it was overwhelming to see bright lights. And these are all things that a lot of autistic people I've met also share. So for me to get that diagnosis, it felt like I'd become part of a community, mm. uh, uh, yeah, a collective group of people that share the same sort of, not issues, but differences. So like I said, not everything is negative. If you, you shouldn't look at everything from a negative point of view. And that brings us onto the second question is, what are the positive things about being diagnosed with autism? So for me, the positive things about being diagnosed with autism or just being autistic generally, for me, the positive is the ability to kind of retain information that I'm interested in. You know, that attention 
attention to detail, that ability to go away, research. If I need to revise for an exam, for example, and I'm really interested in what I might be doing in that exam at school, for example, or maybe at uni, I'm interested in a particular book I need to read for an essay I need to do. I will literally read that book and absorb the information from the book. And I think that's a real positive because that's really, really helpful in order to pass the course and, and, and also you know, be good at what you do if there's, there's a lot of um, knowledge that you need to have on that subject. Well, I think what's, what's good about it as well is like not just we, what we said before is you have that collective group of people that understand how you feel and what you're going through. So you're not alone in the process. And alongside with Ethan saying, you know, he retains the information. I've met people who have autism that tend to be really good with an instrument or really good at drawing, like abnormally good at drawing. This is not Ethan's case. This, did I never ask him to draw. I'm not a good drawer. But never. But if it comes to science and space mm -hmm. and planets or Doctor Who, I love Doctor Who. All of the really cool stuff. All of the cool stuff. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, very cool stuff. Yep. Doctor Who's cool. Yep. Very As the 11th Dr. Matt Smith said in the 11th hour, bow ties are cool. I'm not wearing a bow tie though. <laughs> On that note, let's go to the next question. What things do you find trickier because of being autistic? Social skills, being able to fit in with normal people busy situations, lots of crowds, lots of sort of things going on at once. I mean, for example, if we're walking down the street, right, and we're having a conversation, I might be distracted by something on the other side of the road, oh and I'll be walking up God. the road and staring at that thing. It's a bit like selective hearing, isn't it? But it's not selective. We just call it Ethan Smith syndrome. We just call it Ethan he, Smith syndrome. It, this, I'll be talking with Ethan, he'll go on his phone for a second, we'll be walking, it'll be important. Ethan will be going, yeah, yeah. And then I'll carry on talking and I'll go, Ethan, you get that? And he'll go, sorry, sorry what? I didn't hear you. After like 15 minutes of a discussion to myself. And I'll tell you what, another thing that makes that really tricky is with my girlfriend. So she might tell me something that, you know, I'm supposed to respond in a certain way and listen. And then I think it probably annoys her when someone's just talking to you and then you don't respond or listen. I think a lot of people would agree that a lot of guys are like that. Yeah, so maybe that's yeah. not even the autism. Maybe that's what's yeah. tricky for being a man. It, Ethan is, Ethan's version is just exaggerated. Yes, exactly. So minimal encourages is something that I find quite difficult. The social cues, the body language, facial expressions, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. If someone's smiling, I know they're happy. But if someone's perhaps a little bit annoyed, for normal people you might be able to tell. But for me, like, I might not tell unless they're actually like crying or they've literally physically said, I'm annoyed with you, Ethan, why did you do that? And I don't pick up on those little subtle things. Another thing is tone of voice. I don't really pick up on subtle tones of voice. And Sorry. sometimes when I communicate to people, I use the wrong tone of voice. This is especially tricky in relationships. So I could have phone conversations with my girlfriend and there might be times when she rings me up for a phone conversation and I say, hello. But I don't mean hello as in like, I'm not interested, why have you called? Which could be how it might be interpreted. What I really should be going is, hello, how are you? But I don't have those skills. You shouldn't do that either. I shouldn't do that either. You shouldn't do that either, oh my God. Yeah, one of the things that helped me, um, what do your friends do to help you, yeah? You're meant to retain information after you read it. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that helped me in terms of like my friends helping me with my condition, I mean, I think you're a good example, um, Spooner, because you don't judge me for having autism. Like you're aware that I have it and you understand the condition. So when I do things that might be a little bit different to what you might normally expect in a friendship, you know it's because of my Asperger's, it's because of my condition. And I've got a couple of other friends that also are aware of my condition and, and sort of know it's me being me if I do something a little bit silly in terms of socialising. And I think the main thing that helps with friends is just making sure you have the right friends. I think one of the things is Spooner's quite direct and blunt with me. Um, I think actually I find that helpful um, because if people aren't clear with me about their thoughts, their wishes or whatever, then I can misinterpret. And I think that can be a bit of a problem for me, but 
having friends that are quite direct and honest and open with me i think that really really helps me with my condition just just honestly basically because i'm not going to be upset if you tell me that what i'm doing is strange i'm going to be upset if you don't tell me and then i screw something up and then i kind of figure out for myself uh, i've just like ruined whatever because of how i communicated yeah so I'm a very, like I said, I'm a very blunt person. I'm not judgmental whatsoever. So when I first met Ethan, it just sort of clicked. I didn't know he, well, I knew, I didn't really know much about autism when I first met him. I just liked him. And it's weird talking about you when you're there. But I just liked him and I liked being around him. You know, he's very motivated and dedicated to the things he wanted to do and achieve. And I respected that and was drawn to him more than, I was drawn away from the, the typical neurotypical type of person and drawn towards Ethan because I feel like I got along with him more. What I find people with autism or people like Ethan, whatever you want to say, is they tend to be quite trustworthy. They don't tend to... They just screw you over his friends. Yeah, they just, you just don't... Or backstab you or... Um... Right, Ethan's having PTSD right now, by the sounds of it. <laughs> But yeah, like I found him trustworthy, you know, dedicated, and I learned a lot about it. And then with my job, obviously, I learned more about it. And it doesn't bother me at all, actually. I, have to, I find it amusing sometimes, or most of the time. I just find him funny to talk to. So the camera cut out, and we're not sure where it did, but we're going to proceed anyway. I find what works well for Ethan and other people with autism that I've worked with is having someone that you can trust, have someone that can support you in an environment. Like Ethan had never been abroad. So guess what? We went abroad and he was worried about the flight and he was worried about all these things. I had to hold his little delicate hand on the flight and I got him through it and he was happy for it and we had a lovely time. Even when clubbing or when we're out and about, Ethan will all of a sudden, it'll be three in the morning, it'll be sweaty, it'll be tired. Ethan, with his inability to be coordinative, I'm just using words that don't even exist. Ethan will give it a go. And you could imagine, you know, him there with no coordination, moving about with no emotion on his face, just blank. I physically tell Ethan, smile, you look miserable. And he smiles. And that's what works. Being bluntly direct with him works. And it may work with other people, it may not, people on different levels, but I found what works well with Ethan, it is basically just having a banterous friendship and him having someone that he can trust to support his, his needs and wants. That's basically what I do. It's not, I'm not going out of my way to do anything. We just get along and that's the way it is. Like I make Ethan step out of his comfort zone and that's what works with him. Obviously, like I said, everyone's on different levels. Not Some people can't aren't capable of doing certain things. But what works well with Ethan is I will bluntly tell him, let's go do something. I will, like, I will just force him. I will grab him, drag him out the door, and we'll go and do it. Like, we, that's, and that's what works with him. I think I can recall a time when, yeah, so I struggle in social situations, right? So I think I can recall a time where like we must we went to a pub, didn't we? And there was like a group of us. It was New Year's Eve. We was having fun and everything. He said to me, uh, go talk to that group of girls on the table over there. And it's just a confidence building thing, really, wasn't it? Because I think yeah. you've kind of mentored me in some ways. And, and that's really helped. So he said, go talk to that group of girls over there so I went over and I said hello my name's Ethan Smith and I don't know if you can get much more autistic than that no. can you he, he hit them with the hello I'm Ethan's and I'm, <laughs> I was dying in the back room, just sitting there watching it worked though they came and sat with us but I, I, I was in shock I'm still in shock from how well it went Ethan may have thought you know he could never do that especially you know talking to girls is a big thing or talking to guys as a girl is a big thing and he went up and did it to the point where, you know, I watched these girls turn everyone away. Ethan's lovely autistic handshake slapped in front of their face worked <laughs> and they came and sat with us and the, well, the rest is history. Well, I guess, I guess it's, pract it's practice, isn't it, really? Yeah, we, we don't see it as we're making a friendship with you. We want to talk to you. It's we practice see it, for when you actually meet the one. Yeah, we, we see it as practice of general social skills and building confidence. So, hello, you're a test dummy. That's basically what it is. <laughs> Your existence doesn't matter. You are practice for my future. Say hello to me. In the long run, it has helped because in terms of relationships, I'm with someone who I do want to spend the rest of my life with, a long-term relationship and... Um, Sorry, Karen. I'm with someone who... <laughs> <laughs> I'm with... Go on, you do your thing now. Don't think about me making that noise, go on. 
Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I mean, my social skills have improved through some kind of just practice and confidence building and stuff like that. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a relationship with someone now who understands my condition, which I really, really value. And she supports me as well. And I guess really what it's about in terms of being autistic and kind of making friendships or relationships work, I guess you need friends who are going to help you build confidence. And then when you're more confident, then some of the other things that you might do wrong matter less because you can overcome them because you feel better about yourself you feel good about yourself if you're autistic you should embrace that so what if you don't understand certain facial expressions or body language so what if you can't you know walk into a social situation and talk to anyone you like without making social mistakes that the neurotypical person wouldn't make so what if you're happy and you just embrace your autism, then that will like it will help because you won't worry about what other people think, you won't care, and you will just naturally attract people who don't judge you for your condition. They might find you funny, they might like you because of it, they might think, um, you know, oh, I, I love how um, so and so behaves. I know they're autistic and maybe that's why they behave like that, but you know what? It's good, it's good because they're different, they're not like everyone else. If you can embrace that as someone who's autistic, I think that will help you with relationships because you would just naturally end up with people who, who are genuine. And what we want you to take away from this, whether you're autistic, whether you're supporting someone that is, whether you're you just need general motivation for anything. What we want you to take away from this is that you've heard that we were at the bottom, we're here now. You're listening to us just mutter on and this is the position we're in and we're, we're succeeding and doing well and this is just a stepping stone to where we want to be. We're gonna, we want to be so much higher than this just to prove that we can be. And I think we're that stubborn that we want to do so much better just so we can say, you said we wouldn't do well, and now we're doing a lot better than you. I think what we need is, um, I mean, this is one of the other questions that was on the list about what would make the world a more autism-friendly place. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, yeah, the world's not an autism-friendly place, because if it was, we wouldn't have 30 kids in a class in mainstream schools. We wouldn't have, you know, crowded places. We wouldn't have tight spaces. So when you're on a train and it's full of people, how can someone on the spectrum be expected to get on a train that's fully packed full of people? Oh, well, don't get on it during rush hour. That's a simple answer. But why should autistics be prohibited from, you know, what a mainstream person could be doing? Why, why, why is that the case? I feel that, yes, we do need to have a more autism friendly world. And I think, one of the things that might make it so is getting more people who are autistic with lived experience to share their stories with the world. Going into schools and raising awareness about what autism is and, and education is the key, I think. Education, mentoring is, is the two key things that I, I think the, the world needs to be more autism friendly. We're not sort of saying this is what it is, this is what you should be doing. We're just sharing our experiences, what we struggle with or what I struggle with, what you know kind of works well and what doesn't. Is I would suggest just not being so judgmental don't jump into a thing saying, oh, it's different. A lot, I know how kids can be, and to be fair, a lot of adults that act like kids, that act like children, you know, they discriminate them because of the way they act or the way they are. Educate yourself and understand, and you could end up making, find out, you know, you could have the best relationship with them over any of your other friends. It's just how we turn out. What we take away from this is to remain motivated, to strive for more and to know that no matter how low you are, where you are in your life, there's always an up. If you're at the bottom, you can't go any lower. You can only go up from there on out. So have belief in yourself. And for those that are supporting those in, who are struggling, have belief in them and show them that. Work with them in ways that work for them. And also believe in yourself as well, because if you're a parent of someone who's autistic, there's gonna be times when you wanna give up or you just, feel when can I get time for myself when can I get a break this is a whole big thing um, I'm learning in social work about like respite and, and families that are struggling and they just need time away from their children who are struggling because they need to be able to regenerate and I think it's about if you're a parent and you're always going to criticize yourself I guess because you feel like well are things are there things I'm doing wrong is that why my child's like this but never ever blame yourself life is a journey life is a lesson and you will not learn everything and you will always find out new things and new techniques and strategies of dealing with things but as a parent I would just say to you just fully embrace what you're doing because you are 
doing everything you can for your child. Join support groups, engage with people, ask for support, don't not ask, and just keep on and on and on advocating and campaigning for your child. We hope that you've enjoyed sort of us muttering on and what we've said, and hopefully you take something good away from it. And if you want to find me on social media, if you've got any questions, I will try and reply to them as fast as I can. My Instagram is at Josh Lee Spooner. We're also on Facebook and we've got a website. The website is smithandspoontalks.co.uk. Um, you can find on our website a list of useful links. They might be charities or organisations or articles that might be useful. Um, if you work with young people with any kind of emotional behaviour disorders, ADHD, autism, anything like that. We've also got a Facebook page where you can follow us uh, when we do talks or when we have something inspirational or motivational to share, we will post on there so it's good to follow. And you can obviously communicate with us via Facebook Messenger as well if you want to. And I'll also do vlogs on YouTube of when we do talks and things like that when eventually we are able to. My YouTube is Josh Spoon if you want to follow along on the vlogs where you get to see us more sort of together on our personalities and the talks that we do. I put them on there sometimes as well. So we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening and...